tonight is to extend the question not only by repeating the question what is Africa to me but by saying what is Africa to Africans and what is Africa to the world many people have lost their nationhood Many people have been covered. Many people have been abused. And yet, our laws are singularly the greatest laws of any people in human history. Our laws were so great that it was difficult for us to recover because we lost self-confidence and we lost the image of the world as we had previously conceived the world. And our laws were so devastating when it was over, or almost over, we could not <coughs> against God in a language of our own choosing. Uh, imagine God as any person that looked like us. And we began to accept the image of God resembling our slave master. This image has damaged our mind because no matter what that image has done to you, you are reluctant to challenge the image for fear you're harming the image of God. You will kill each other for stepping on your freshly shined shoes but you won't kill anything that looks like that image. You can steal a black man's country and get away with it. Steal his lady, he'll kill you. But only after you're black. People who have been permitted through oppression to turn on you the one thing that you should use to maneuver yourself through the world, the image of yourself as brought into the world by faith, God, in your mother and father. If you say you don't like that image, that means you are denying what your mother and father would faith in God, no matter what you call him, did for you. You're also forgetting that good is a relative term, and what is good for one people may not be for another people, and when people out of power come to power and rearranges power, good becomes what the new powerful people approves of, and bad becomes what the new powerful people intends to oppress. We forgot that we rule the state. One of the things which hampers even entrepreneurship in our own community is that entrepreneurship is part and parcel of the state. And we have forgotten state formation and state management. And if you forget how to rule a state, you will forget how to rule a candy store. 
and one thing relates to the other. Because if the mind can conceive of one, it can conceive of the other. Many people coming to this country, though defeated and oppressed in their own land, come from a country where they saw their people managing stores, where they saw their people as petty judges, schoolmasters, running things as the basic heads of things. The most devastating blow of oppression that struck our mind was oppression in the United States. And the African has not thoroughly understood the nature of oppression in the United States, nor have the Caribbean people understood the nature of oppression. Nor have they understood their own world responsibility in African reconstruction in giving to the world a new image of the African people in head of a state. Because when they came to power, being a majority, neither in the Caribbean islands nor in Africa, did one truly African state with African values emerge. Every single state, no exception, is an imitation European state. They too forgot the time in our history when we rule the state by values we develop, by spirituality we develop, by a code of honor we develop. And when we rule the state in that manner, we produce enduring societies that lasted thousands of years without a jail system because no one had ever gone to jail, so you needed no system. You did not have a word in your language that meant jail. Now, what prevailed and to what extent did the African mind exercise itself at this period in history to produce an atmosphere peaceful enough not to need a jail system, not to need a place of confinement. There are a lot of things I can tell you to read, but I know I am wasting my time because a lot of people listen to what you say they should read. They are intrigued by it, but they never stir themselves to read it. In a back issue of the Journal of African Civilization, I think it is the issue dealing with now bad civilization or the issue dealing with great African thinkers, Shikata Dio has written one of the most concise essays of our time. I don't know who read it because I have not met a single person who's willing to, willing to discuss it with me. It's called African Contribution to Civilization, the exact time. Last year, only a few months ago, his main protege, Theophil Obanga, delivered a lecture from his major new book, The Pharaonic Origins of Greek Philosophy. In this lecture, he pointed out not only that Africa is the origin of Greek philosophy, but that the word philosophy is not even Greek or European. 
But not only did not create philosophy, they didn't even create the word. And when people look back and, and look at the stolen property of Africa, that these icebox people are selling to the world as their property, you would understand a lot of things, including the book, that need to be reread. The Iceman Inheritance. Now, this is not the greatest book from a point of view of literature or organization, but its revelation and its confession, its omission breaks new ground because it is rare that a person on that side of the line makes these admissions, <laughs> literally saying that the Europeans came into the world with a parasitic idea and they maintained themselves in the world by preying on other people and creating a smoke screen to give you the illusion that they are right. Now, if you understood what I'm trying to say, you would understand why peace is deliberately delayed in that little drama in the sand where there can be no clear winner because the war was stupid from both sides. <laughs> And had we stayed out of it and given them a chance to settle it and stop going into it with a lie about it's about, but it's about oil when it's not about oil at all, because oil can be maintained, oil can be obtained from many places in the world other than Arabia other than that, that part of the world. So what is it really about? It's about Western dominance over the resources of the world. Western military might, political might, financial might, putting everybody in the world in their place, in their place is to be at the service of Western man, basically white men. What you are witnessing, and this might be too much of a digression, is a revolt in the servants' quarters. <laughs> in the 15th and the 16th century, the Europeans identified certain portions of the world as their homes or their outposts. All the rest of the world became their servants' quarters. There is now a revolt in the servants' quarters. And they're trying to put down that revolt. But the servant now in revolt is schizophrenic. <laughs> because the servant thought he and his money made him one of them, an honorary oppressor. <laughs> They're trying to slap him down and let him know that a servant is a servant and you don't hang out in the living room. <laughs> don't make you my equal. Right. But the servant got enough nerve to threaten one of their servants created to serve them, created as a holding station and as a watching post for them. A white nation in an eastern sea so now, 
The war is more about Israel than it is about God. But we won't see this because we assume because we buy mythology quicker than we buy truth, we think it's about somebody's homeland. The people who, who permitted the nation to be established could care less than a damn whether Jews have a homeland or not. The people who permitted the nation to come into being turned their back and let millions of them go to the gas chamber. So there's no great love for them on the part of the people who put them down in this eastern sea to protect white interests and because they are people who legitimately never had a homeland but longed for one out of that mythology they gave them one and made them pay a high price for it. It was the homeland inside of their mind. <laughs> but in actuality, the one they had in the Bible, even if it was legitimate and I said it was not, that one did not belong to those Europeans who were belatedly converted to the faith and who have no direct relationship to the biblical Jews, whoever the biblical Jews happen to be. <laughs> now let's go back and examine this African mind in the beginning of time because this African mind existed for so many years before there was a Europe, before the civilizations of the Tigris and the Euphrates existed. This African mind had brought into being the spirituality that would later be the basis of all of the world's major religions he had also brought into being the writing, the book coming forth by night and day that would later become the basis of the world's philosophy and the basis of a great book of folklore called the Bible. And when I say the Bible is a book of folklore, I'm not downgrading it, I am properly identifying it. <laughs> Jewish folklore stating moral lessons, the lessons of good lessons, lessons of truth, lessons of morality. And I have said before, many times you tell a story to illustrate the truth. If the truth of the story gets across, the illustration need not necessarily be the truth. If you get the book. <laughs> All right, I'm going to tell you the whole story. I'll tell you ten times this one. You're going to be the Call a spider. He never sang in sight. Greed as he could be. He heard that there was going to be a banquet. Two banquets, close together. He wanted to go to both of them. So he went near the banquet. He tied a string around his waist. He told one friend, When the banquet started over there, you pull, now come over here and eat. Start over here, you pull, now come over there and eat. And you guessed it, what happened. Both banquets started at the same time. <laughs> Both friends obeyed the order and pulled and pulled and pulled until they had shrunk his waistline. <laughs> now, African mothers to this day tell this story to young people to tell them eat enough but not too much. 
Now, if the young people get across the truth of what the mother is saying, is it important whether the illustration is the truth? The illustration was made up, but the, but the, the lesson from the illustration is true. You shouldn't eat so much. My main point is that in an age where very few people wrote or read books, do not think there was no wisdom in the world. Because men told stories of wisdom. Finally, some people wrote those stories down. And this became, became the book's end. The, the book of the coming forth by day and night, mistakenly called the book of the dead. It was called the book of the dead because when the British were robbing graves throughout Egypt, some Arab stumbled on a grave and found a great manuscript. And the British wanted to buy it. He said, where did you get it from? He pointed to one of the tombs where he stole it. He said, from those dead people over there. And the British called it the Book of the Dead. The Africans called it the Book of the Coming Forth by day and night. This would be one of the most influential books in the history of the world. Because with, with the Hebrew migration in Africa, into Africa, they would read this book and other books and copy from them the basis not only of their religion, but the basis of so much of their literature. I am not trying to delegitimatize anything. I'm trying to explain the nature of its creation. And that all of this was a creation of the African mind. There was another book among the many books, the Tapas of Annie, Tapas of Kunafa. But the Tapas of Kunafa, one man but the purpose of Kananu. A man was going to the market. And some man wanted to pay a check on him, see if he could take something from him. So he put his clothes all across the road. So if he go, if he walk on my clothes, I'm gonna accuse him of that. If he comes through my field, I'm gonna accuse him of that. And so he went through the field, knocked down and stopped the man's corn. So the man took it to court. And he went pleading his case. He pleaded his case so well. They told the, the king, he's man up there pleading his case so well. And the king said, keep him talking, keep him talking. So someone went and wrote it down. And his plea became law. <laughs> His plea of what he what he had a right to and what he had why he should be protected became part of the law of the land. This is what Sheikh and that the oak was trying to explain when he said the origin of civil law began with the African taboo. Once you decide what not to do you can arrive at what to do. Once you decide what you should do, you can get a handle on what you should not do. Taboo means what you should not do. That's the first thing the African arrives at, what he should not do. And by process of elimination, he can find out what he should do. This was the beginning of civil law, not the laws of Haberati that came 200, 2000 BC. The Africans were working this out 3000, 4000 BC. 3000 years before the laws of Haberati. 
Yet when Hammurabi's law came on, he was from Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. People said, this is the beginning of civil law. He wrote out his codes. And he said, it's all right to have a slave, but you got to give him Saturday off. What kind of humane law is that? You can beat the slave all right, but you can only beat him with a stick, a stick of same size. Islam would come along. Another brain of humane law. You can beat your wife. A lot of people don't even read the Quran. It's right in the Quran. I defy you to read it. You can beat your wife a box. You can beat her on it with a certain size stick. And if she misbehaves, you can deny her food until she repents. What kind of humanity is this? What kind of religion is this? We go back to these laws created by the Africans before the formation of any religion. Very humane laws. We see the African mind now working at its very best. When Africa had developed dynastic laws, laws that govern the spirituality of the human being. No fights between religions and religions because there were no religions. When I say there were no religions, I don't mean a single human being was without God. We had a universal spirituality man and a woman did not even have to worship the same God.